Good evening, everyone. How are you? Good. Enjoying the rain? Yes. We definitely need more rain. <laughs> we should pray for more rain. Um, so if you'd like to just stand, and then I will open up. Heavenly Father, I just thank you, Lord, for this day you've made. We thank you, Lord, that you are God Almighty, God everlasting, the all-knowing Prince of Peace. We just thank you, Lord, for who you are and not just for what you do. I thank you, Lord, for also bringing the South Side safely here today. Um, and I just pray for any, all those who are trying to make their way to church, Lord, um, that you give them genuine mercies. I just commit this whole meeting onto you, and I just pray, Lord, you respond positively to the word um, spoken, Lord, and that we'll be doers of the word and not just hearers only. I just pray, Lord, that you'll look after and take care of um, Derma and Sharon and the family as they're out in Ireland, Lord. And I just pray, Lord, that you'll give them good rest that's out there. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. All good gifts around us are sent from heaven above. Oh, thank the Lord, oh, thank the Lord.
be seated. Please welcome Aaron. Good evening, everyone. Thank you, thank you very much. Shall we stand? Shall we start? I wonder, what do we expect? Shall we pray and then start? Hmm? All right. Dear Lord, we thank you for once again bringing us into your presence. We thank you for the chance that we have to read your word and to try to make sense of the things that you've given us. And we thank you for the inspiration that wrote the scriptures, but also we thank you in advance for the inspiration to receive the scriptures. And so we ask this evening, as we're about to read what we're about to read, please bless us, secure our minds, shore up our emotions, help us to understand that you love us and that you have prepared this for us. And so help us to hear, to think, to digest, and to leave this building better than when we came in. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 So, good evening again to all. <laughs> um, we are going to, the 30 seconds uh, recap on where we were last week and the last time. Was it last week? It wasn't last week. Yes, it was last week. All right. So previously I asked four questions and we've added a fifth last week. The first four questions. Who or what is our emphasis? Who or what is our focus on? Who or what is our goal or target? Where do our loyalties lie? Those are the first four questions from about a month ago, then last week, the question was asked, what do we see? And that was re regarding all of the distractions that are around us and abound around us, especially in a place like London where everything is so busy. Right now, it's real easy to think about church because we're in church. But tomorrow morning, we won't be in church. And the world, life, is in our face everything is in our face and it's really easy to allow everything that's in our face to be the main focus what do they say people tend to focus on what is urgent and not what is important and we have this bad habit everyone lots of people I should say of miss um, appointing or making the wrong choices about what is important and misinterpreting the thing that is urgent against and putting it in the place of something that is actually important. So I showed a picture of the stars because a couple of weeks ago we went to a place called Exmoor which is called a dark park. And the actual fact is even at uh, after midnight it was still bright enough to see the outline of the trees against the sky and if you, you know, adjusted your eyes and waited a moment you could actually see the stars which you don't often do in London. Okay, so the five questions. Who or what is our emphasis? Who or what is our focus on? Who or what is our goal or target? Where do our loyalties lie? What do we see? And all of this is referring to Jesus. Because our focus should be him, our, our emphasis should be him, our goal or target should be him and his work, I should say his work manifesting in our lives. Where do our loyalties lie? That should be an easy one. It should be to the Lord. He as the priority. Ourselves last. So him, others, ourselves. And what do we see? And the reason we ask this question is because there are so many distractions and there are so many voices and it's really easy to not listen to the correct voices. We are going to go back to John again. And today we're going to try and look at um, progression. And there's another question to add. Question number six. What do we believe? 
Okay? And so we're in chapter 6, and we're going to, like last week, we're going to read through some, then jump to next places, and hopefully it will tie together and we'll uncover some things that will be worthwhile. All right? I just want to make sure that we've got something here. There we go. Good. Got it. It says, chapter 6 and verse 1, After these things, Jesus went over to the Sea of Galilee, which is the, in, which is the Sea of Tiberias. And a great multitude followed him, because they saw his miracles, which he did on them that were diseased. And Jesus went up into a mountain, and there he sat with his disciples. And the Passover, a feast of the Jews, was nigh. It's very interesting how, how, at least in these next few chapters, I've noticed how the assignment of the title of the Jews, because the people were Jews as well, but it was actually assigned to like the established church as it were you know the established traditional religious governing body let's call it verse 5 when Jesus then lifted up his eyes and saw a great company come unto him he saith unto Philip whence shall we buy bread that these may eat and this he said to prove him for he himself knew what he would do, which has been an emphasis for a long time. Jesus will know what he's going to do. Matter of fact, he knew what he was going to do at the sea, at the uh, wedding feast at Cana. He knew what he was going to do. But the people have to learn. We have to learn. The teacher says, what's two and two? The teacher knows that it creates four, but the child has to learn. Right. Philip answered him, this is verse 7, Philip answered him, 200 pennyworth of bread is not sufficient for them that every one of them may take a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, saith unto him, There is a lad here, which hath five barley loaves and two small fishes, but what are they among so many? And Jesus said, Make the men sit down. Now there was much grass in the place, so the men sat down, in number about five thousand. And Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed to the disciples, and the disciples to them that were set down, and likewise of the fishes, as much as they would. And when they were filled, he said unto his disciples, Gather up the fragments that they remain, that nothing be lost. That's very important. There was nothing wasted as much as we have things in our lives that we say oh, I'm not sure about that Jesus doesn't let anything go to waste there are lessons in everything and that's just touching it that's that there's so much more under the surface that we're not going to get to right now but Jesus doesn't let anything get to waste your life is not a waste you can try and waste it but he won't all right. Therefore they gathered them together and filled twelve baskets with the fragments of the five barley loaves which remained over and above unto them that had eaten. It would be very interesting to know what was done with the remaining food, don't you think? Because if it's, if it's going to be gathered up, they wouldn't just leave the baskets in the field somewhere, let them just be tidy. No, that it, maybe it was given to the poor. We don't know. Anyway, then those men... When they had seen the miracle that Jesus did, said, This is of a truth, that prophet that should come into the world. So even though they didn't give the title, they must have known who they were talking about, that prophet. When Jesus therefore perceived that they would come and take him by force to make him a king, he departed again into the mountain himself alone. And when even was now come, his disciples went down unto the sea and entered into a ship, and went over the sea toward Capernaum, and it was now dark, and Jesus was not come to them. But they still went on the, on the ship anyway, right? And the sea arose by reason of a great wind that blew, so that when they had rowed about five and, thir tw excuse me, five and twenty or thirty furlongs, so it's twenty-five or thirty furlongs, they see Jesus walking on the sea and drawing nigh unto the ship, and they were afraid. I wonder, would we be afraid? 
I think I would be a bit afraid. That's reality, isn't it? You don't expect to see someone that you know walking on the sea. And they're not close to the land. This is important because it says 25 or 30 furlongs. That is approximately three and a half or three to three and a half miles out or across. And the distance between one point and another, we don't know what route they would have taken, but the distance from Tiberius to Capernaum by boat is approximately five miles. And the Sea of Galilee is about 43 meters deep. That's 22 ver uh, copies of me standing on top of each other. So it's not shallow, and it's not close to land, and they've been doing it a while, and they were, many of them were um, seasoned seamen, right? So they knew what they were doing, and Jesus is walking to them. And here's where it gets a bit interesting as well. Anyway, they're afraid. Then he says, it is I... Be not afraid. Someone said to me recently, one of the nicest things that they can think of is when a parent says to a child who's woken up at night and they, I don't know, they're worried or they're crying. Normally when children wake up in the middle of the night, tears are about to happen. Maybe it's a bad dream. Maybe they want some water. Maybe they want some milk, whatever. But the parent says, don't worry, go back to sleep. And to them, that person, it's a lovely thought that the parent can just say, don't worry, go back to sleep. Like everything's all right, you've got nothing to worry about. Jesus says, it is I, be not afraid. Go back to sleep, everything's fine. Then they willing, interesting adverb here, then they willingly received him into the ship. As opposed to being afraid and saying back off, willingly they let him into the ship. And immediately the ship was at the, uh, the land whither they went. So they jumped two miles. Alternatively, they were so relieved and started talking that, you know that time when you're driving perhaps and you don't remember all of the turns that you took and you just ended up at home somehow? It's perhaps something like that perception, but the words say, immediately the ship was at the land whither they went. If it's according to that, that's a miracle. That's a small one. You, not many people noticed it, but it's recorded as a miracle. The day following, when the people which stood on the other side of the sea saw that there were none other boat there, there was none other boat there, save the one hitherto, uh, whereunto the, uh, the disciples were entered, and that Jesus went not with his disciples into the boat, but that his disciples were gone away alone, how be it? There came other boats from Tiberius nigh unto the place where they did eat bread after that the Lord had given thanks. When the people therefore saw that Jesus was not there, neither his disciples, they also took shipping, they followed him and came to Capernaum seeking for Jesus. This is progression, right? Because the first thing that happened in this chapter, people's attention and appetite was caught. The attention gets caught because it's a miracle to break five loaves and two fish into enough to feed so many. That catches their attention. And it wouldn't have been done unless they were hungry. And they were hungry. And so they ate. So that fed their appetite as well as their attention. Nothing was lost. Even that which was gathered up, something must, good must have been done with it. And now he, Jesus, has provided bread by multiplying the loaves and fish. That was on one part of the land. Then they cross, they being Jesus and the disciples, and the crowd start to follow. Don't forget that, okay? Okay, so chapter 6 and verse 26. Jesus answered them and says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, You seek me, not because you saw the miracles, but because you did eat of the loaves and were filled. Labor not for the meat which perishes, 
but for that which meat which endure, endureth unto everlasting life, which the Son of Man shall give unto you, for him hath God the Father sealed. All right. I believe that he was already speaking about himself. Labor for me. Not just necessarily for doing Jesus' bidding, but he is the bread of life. Then they said unto him, what shall we do that we might work the works of God? So maybe they're starting to get the message. Jesus answered and said unto them, this is the work of God, that ye believe on him who he hath sent. Who's he? He is the Lord, right? And they said, We're, uh, therefore unto him, what sign showest thou then that we may see and believe thee? What dost thou work? Our fathers did eat manna in the desert. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Then Jesus says unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Moses gave you not that bread from heaven, but my Father giveth you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he which cometh down from heaven and giveth life unto the world. Remember where we started. We started on the, at Tiberias, where the feeding of the 5,000 took place. Then we're at Capernaum. People that were fed came with him or followed him. And now they're getting the next part of the story. They've been eating bread and fish. Now they're hearing where the true bread is. For the bread of God is he which cometh down from heaven and giveth life unto the world. 34. Then they said unto him, Lord, evermore give us this bread. And Jesus says to them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh unto me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. At the well, um, Jacob's well, when he is speaking to the Samaritan uh, woman, what did he tell the disciples? My meat is to do the will of him that has sent me. Because they were trying to get Jesus to eat food. But he, at that point, didn't need it now, did he? Because that's what he had declared, that God's work, doing God's work and God's will, was meat enough for him. Right? I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. But I say unto you, that you have also seen me, and believe not. All that the Father giveth to me shall come to me, and him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. He didn't cast out the extras of the bread. He gathered them up. There's more progression here. Now, instead of just casting away the physical bread, he's talking about people that will in no wise be cast out. For I came down from heaven not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. And this is the Father's will which has sent me, that of all which he hath given me, I should lose nothing. Nothing gets cast away. But should raise it up again at the last day. And this is the will of him that sent me, that everyone which seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at that last day, at the last day. The Jews, that's the establishment, then murmured at him because he said, I am the bread which came down from heaven. And they said, Is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How is it then that he saith, I come down from heaven? So there's clashing there, right? Jesus therefore answered and said to them, Murmur not amongst yourselves, No man can come to me except the Father which hath sent me. Draw him, and I will raise him up at the last day. All right. This is really important. No man comes unto the Father, and, uh, to Jesus, unless the Father draws him. That's verse 44. And we will see how this plays out in a minute. Don't forget this verse. This is rather important. And especially remember who he's talking to. The Jews, which is the top brass, the people with authority, the people that are direct, the establishment that are directing the people, the way they think, the way they act, the way they carry out their traditions and so forth. It is written, this is verse 45, it is written in the prophets that they shall be all taught of God. Every man therefore that hath heard 
and hath learned of the Father, cometh unto me. Remember who he's talking to. Not that any man hath seen the Father, save he which of, is of God, he hath seen the Father. Verily, verily, I say unto the, to you, he that believeth on me hath everlasting life. He's pushing this. I am that bread of life. Your fathers did eat manna in the wilderness and are dead. It was physical bread, like the five loaves and the two fish. This is the bread which cometh down from heaven, that a man may eat thereof and not die. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. Now that is a tough one. That's a tough one. Because how does that work? How does it work? The Jews therefore strove amongst themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Then Jesus says unto them, Very verily I say unto you, Except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man, and drink his blood, ye have no life in you. This is even more challenging now. Whoso eateth my flesh, and drinketh my blood, hath eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood dwelleth in me and I in him. The food that we eat in a physical world, the food that we eat becomes part of us. And it's not that this is where you can get doctrinally way off being and say communion is something else. But I believe that it's partaking in him, as it were, his lifestyle in if any man wants to come after me, let him take up his cross daily and follow me. So it's your partaking in spiritually his flesh and his blood, his offering. And if you take that into you, then what he says there is, I will be in you, you will be in me, you will join. That's rather important. He that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood dwelleth in me and I in him. As the living Father hath sent me, and I live by the Father, so that he eateth me, he that eateth me, even he shall live by me. God sustains us. This is that bread which came down from heaven. Not as your fathers did eat manna, and are dead, he that eateth of this bread shall live forever. These things said he in the synagogue, as he caught, taught in Capernaum. Many therefore his disciples when they had heard this, said, this is an hard saying. Who can hear it? It is a tough one. If your eyes aren't spiritually open enough to take it, and it is a tough one to take, then they started to fall back. When Jesus, uh, let's see, and who can hear it? And when Jesus knew himself that his disciples murmured at it, he said unto them, doth this offend you? What? And if he shall see the Son of Man ascend up where he was before, it is the spirit that quickeneth. In other words, this is a spiritual thing. You have to be alive to hear it. The flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they, they are spirit and they are life. We must worship God in spirit and in truth. But there are some of you that believe not. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were that believed not and who should betray him. And he said, Therefore I say unto you, that no man can come unto me, except it were given to him, unto him of my Father. Remember who the audience is. This is critical, right? From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. Then Jesus said unto the twelve, Will you also go away? So that must have been a massive fall off. So feeding of the five thousand, look at the progress. Feeding of the five thousand, some of them went to Capernaum after being fed. They want some more miracles. They're talking to Jesus. Jesus reveals, actually, you know that manna that happened in the Old Testament when uh, you were leaving Egypt, etc. Well, that's one type of bread sent from the Lord, but I am the bread of life that is sent from the Father above. And all of that people is reduced to very small amounts. Will you also go away to the disciple of 12? Then Simon Peter, quick answers, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast 
the words of eternal life. And we believe and are sure that thou art that Christ. Again, be careful how you hear. Because earlier the people were saying, is he that prophet? That was unnamed at that verse, right? We are, you are that Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus answered them, have I not chosen you twelve and one of you is the devil? He spake of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, for he it was that should betray him, being one of the twelve. All right, so chapter six. There's loads more in there, but we're coming to chapter seven. And we're not going to read the whole thing. I promise you I'm not going to take very long, I think. But we're looking at what do we believe? And we're looking at a progressive challenge. Okay? So the feast is about to happen. We are in uh, chapter 7. After these things, Jesus walked in Galilee, for he would not walk in Jewry because the Jews sought to kill him. The Jews is a very interesting thing. Remember who he's talking about when, he, when it says the Jews. That's the established uh, religious group that are ordering things. So, now the Jews' feast of tabernacles was at hand. His brethren, therefore, said unto him, Depart hence. Who's his brethren? His brothers, his actual physical brothers, right? Brothers' brothers, not disciples. His brethren, therefore, said unto him, Depart hence and go into Judea, that thy disciples, that thy disciples, also may see the works that thou doest. For there is no man that doeth anything in secret, and he himself seeketh to be known openly. If thou do these things, show thyself to the world. In other words, go on. For neither did his brethren believe in him. At this stage. Because it comes later. Then Jesus said to them, My time is not yet come, but your time is always ready. The world cannot hate you, but it hateth me, because I testify of it, that the works thereof are evil. Now, let's see where, where we are. Let's see, let's see, let's see. It was about two chapters ago. It dawned on me that Jesus calls himself the Son of Man, and he has license to do that because he says it somewhere along, along here, that because he is also the Son of God and the Son of Man, and he keeps on calling himself the Son of Man, the Son of Man, the Son of Man. Why would he do that? Because he is justified in calling sin, sin, because he is the sinless one. So, the world cannot hate you, but me it hateth, because I testify of it that the works thereof are evil. How does he testify? Because his works are not evil. Jesus is the sinless Son of Man. He is able to testify against the sins of the world, being justified in that position. But I didn't say condemn. He testifies against. He doesn't need to condemn. We are all condemned already. Right? Here we go. And when he did, uh, let's see. You go you up to this feast. I, I go not up yet unto this feast, for my time is not yet full come. And when he had said these words unto them, he abode still at Galilee. But when his brethren were gone up, then went he also up unto the feast. Not openly, but as it were, in secret. He didn't want to be seen just yet. Then the Jews sought him at the feast and said, where is he? So that's why he didn't go out openly, right? Remember again, who were we talking to a minute ago? The Jews. Who were seeking him? The Jews. And they, they, there's some things going on here. And there was much murmur among the people concerning him. For some said, he is a good man. And others said, nay, but he deceiveth the people. So now you've got factions, right? But here's the bit. Nobody is speaking openly about him. Howbeit no man spake openly of him for fear of the Jews repercussions are coming Jesus reveals his doctrine even further 
the same as when he was a child, the Jews marveled at his knowledge. Ready? It says, Now in the midst of the feast, in the midst of the feast, Jesus went up to the temple and taught. So first he was in secret, trying to not let people see him. Now he went and taught because that was his, uh, he had to, right? And the Jews marveled saying, how know if this man letters having never learned? Which is kind of an interesting way to, to think about it because he might have learned somewhere that they didn't know. But Jesus answered them and said, my doctrine isn't mine, but he that sent me. If any man will do his will, he shall know of the doctrine, whether it be of God or whether I speak of myself. Remember, in verse 44 of chapter 6, no man can come to me except the Father which hath sent me draw him. No, man, no one gets to Jesus unless they've been pre-selected. Right? Okay. If any man will do his will, he shall know of the doctrine, whether it be of God or whether I speak of myself. He that speaketh of himself seeketh his own glory. But he that seeketh his own glory that sent him, sorry, but he that seeketh his glory that sent him, the same is true. And no unrighteousness is in him. In other words, I'm not talking about myself. I'm talking about God the Father, because God sent me. Did not Moses give you the law, and yet none of you keepeth the law? Ooh, that's a hot one. Why go ye about to kill me? All right. So if they're not keeping the law, then they're not doing God's will, and they're not investing themselves in God's way. Remember, he made his acts known to the people of Israel, but his ways he made known to Moses. So Moses was interested in finding out who God was. The people found out what God can do. And that's what's happening here with the Pharisees. They kind of can know what God can do. They're seeing the miracles. You can't deny the miracles. When Jesus heals a blind man, you can't throw a ball at his head and he doesn't catch it and say, actually, you're blind after all. You know, it doesn't work like that. So they're seeing what happens, but they're not understanding why it happens. They're not invested in knowing God the Father. If they would have known God the Father, then they'd know the doctrine, and then therefore they would have known Jesus' doctrine. All right. Did not Moses give you the law, and yet none of you keepeth the law? Why go you about to kill me? The people answered and said, Thou hast a devil. Who goeth about to kill thee? In other words, you're balmy. You crazy. Jesus answered and said unto them, I have done one work, and you all marvel. Moses therefore gave unto you circumcision, not because it is of Moses, but of the fathers, and ye on the Sabbath day circumcise a man. If a man on the Sabbath day receives circumcision, in other words, you do work, that the law of Moses should not be broken, are ye angry at me because I have made a man every whit whole on the Sabbath day? I'm doing God's will on the Sabbath day, and you hate me for it. Judge not according to the appearance, but judge righteous judgment. The Lord sees the heart. Man see, uh, judges on the outward appearance. Then said some of the, them, some of Jer them in Jerusalem, Is not this he whom they seek to kill? But lo, he speaketh boldly. He went in secret at first. Now he's speaking in the midst. Now he's speaking boldly. And they say nothing unto him. Do the rulers know indeed that this is the very Christ? So, the theory at least is, and my theory is, because they don't say anything against what he's just said, the people are further in two minds because is it that the, the top people are actually kind of agreeing with him? Are they actually starting to discover that he is the Christ? How be it we know this man uh, whence he is, sorry, we, how, be it, how be it we know this man whence he is, but when Christ cometh, no man knoweth whence he is. Then he then cried Jesus in the temple as he taught, saying, You both know me, and you know whence I am, and I am not come of myself, but he that sent me is true, whom you know not. Remember, if you see in Jesus, you see in God the Father. If you see God the Father, you see in Jesus. But I know him, for I am from him, and he hath sent me. Then they sought to take him, but no man laid hands on him because his hour was not yet come. Right. 
Okay. Why don't they know his doctrine? Because they weren't drawn by the Father. Because they're not interested in knowing the Father. They're interested in knowing their traditions. I'm tempted to think that Jesus was addressing the Pharisees and the top establishment to, to, to get them to understand and influence the people. But as well, this is where I've, I'm starting to settle. This is the development or the establishment of the New Testament. The Old Testament testifies to Jesus. Remember, God testifies of Jesus. Jesus testifies of God. All of the prophets in the past point to Jesus. But they don't know the, doc the guys that are supposed to be doctors of the law, etc., etc. Can't detect it. They can't see Jesus for who he is. He fulfills all of the prophecy. He fulfills all of the Old Testament. And this is why the establishment should have seen Jesus for who he is. But because they're only interested in what God can do, they're not interested in who God is, they didn't even notice who he was. He has even said that he had come to fulfill the law, not break it, right? Well, that's what he was doing. Now, verse 37, and we've almost already finished. In the last day, the great day of that feast, so notice the progression, okay? Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come to me and drink. So, at the beginning of chapter 7, he's going in secret because he doesn't want to get noticed at first. Halfway through the chapter, he starts teaching in the temple and the Jews are marveling at his ab ability in the doctrine. On the last day, that's when it says, that great day of the feast, in other words, everybody's there, Jesus stood and cried out. You don't say that word, cried out, unless you're really going at the top of your lungs. This is the opposite of being in secret. If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the scripture hath said, referring to the witness before, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. But this he spake he of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive. For the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because that Jesus was not yet glorified. Many of the people, therefore, when they heard this saying, said of a truth, this is the prophet, with a capital P, the prophet. Others said, this is the Christ. Isn't it when Jesus was baptized and you had certain people heard a noise of thunder, certain other people thought they heard angels, and certain other people believed that they heard the voice of the Lord? And here you've got some people saying, hmm, of a truth, that is, this is that prophet. Some people are saying, this is the Christ. But some said, shall Christ come out of Galilee? Hath not the scripture said that Christ cometh of the seed of David and out of the town of Bethlehem where David was? So there was a division among the people because of him. Look at what it says. It's so interesting. They know the details and yet. So there was a division among the people because of him. And some of them would have taken him, but no man laid hands on him. Then came the officers to the chief priests and Pharisees and they said unto them, Why have you not brought him? They obviously were doing a job. The officers answered, Never man spake like this man, because he had authority and power. Then answered them the Pharisees, Are ye also deceived? And this is where we have the kind of the crescendo of tonight's little session. What do we believe? What's that phrase? If your light is darkness, then how great is your darkness? Bright. Never man have spake like this man. They went and saw Jesus. They were supposed to take him, but they heard him and stopped with the action of taking him. When asked, 
Nobody's like him. In other words, I don't think we should. Let's not do this. I don't think that we should take this person. Nobody talks like him. They get back and report back. Why didn't you take him? Nobody speaks like him. Are you deceived? That's what the Pharisees were asking the officers that were told to arrest him. Are you deceived as well? Have any of the rulers or of the Pharisees believed on him? How, if your light is darkness, how great is your darkness? But this people who know if not the law are cursed. Nicodemus saith unto them, he that came to Jesus by night, which we previously discussed, being one of them, doth our Lord judge any man before it hear him and know what he doeth? Listen to this. Their word, before, be sure your words will find you out, your sins will find you out, and your words will testify against you. They answered and said to him, Art thou also of Galilee? In other words, mocking Nicodemus. You want Galilee to be famous, is that right? Search and look. Search and look in the scriptures. Te see if it, it, what it says. Does it say that a prophet is going to come out of Galilee? In other words, search and look. They know that Jesus comes from Bethlehem. You can't look into this man as strongly as they have been and not know, oh, it's Mary and Joseph's son? Where are they from? Oh, they're from Bethlehem. Oh, okay. Oh, he must be from Galilee. No, no, no. He's from Bethlehem. But they choose to ignore that stuff because they're so blind. They're so blind by their traditions. They're so blind. They're accusing Nicodemus of being blind and they're blind. Art thou also of Galilee? Search and look. For out of Galilee ariseth no prophet. Hold on. So you're saying that you know the scriptures? Which they do. Hold on. You're saying that you've done your research into the man because you know he's Mary and Joseph's son and where they're from. Also the census will happen, but we don't know how privy they were of that bit. So they, they do know that he's from Bethlehem. So in other words, all these prophecies are being fulfilled and yet they choose not to believe in him. Those are the people that were influencing the mass people. All right. And every man went unto his own house. If your light is darkness, how great is your darkness? And even there exists a witness, this is what I've written down, Nicodemus, and they dismiss him, telling him to search the scriptures, which they know, the very thing they should have seen Jesus in. But they didn't. Why do we have this? Because... Why are we looking? This is the question I have overall, and we're going to go through probably next time up, I'm up here, we're going to go into the next chapters and so forth. Why do we believe in Jesus? Why? We need to look at the life of the man. If we tell the person who's querying and saying, well, almost you convinced me to be a Christian, what do we normally tell them? Read the book of John. We're reading the book of John. Now we shouldn't be so weak in our minds that we can, we, when we ask ourselves the question, why should I believe in Jesus, that we fail and stop believing in Jesus. What we should be doing is investing ourselves to get to know him more and more. He is the bread of life. And we can see only in two chapters, beginning at chapter 6, we can see that he provided for the people Bread and fish he provided for them and brought them with him. Then, further, he progresses to say, I am actually the bread of life. You've had bread for your belly, but this is the real bread of life. Just like in the past, manna was, as it were, bread for the belly, but I am the bread of life. And if you take part of me, and I take part in you, you will have everlasting life. This is what he's saying. And he had authority because no man spake like that man. That's why the people resisted actually doing their job and arresting him. Surely then, they had something in front of them that they could start to believe in. Right? Now, if we were to go further and start finding the prophecies and looking at that, knowing how wide and how broad and how deep the scriptures are concerning Jesus, and then say, you know what, if he fulfills that and that and that and that and that, 
this, there's something to this guy. We're able to see it and we choose to believe it. So the very question of why should we believe in Jesus should not be a stumbling block to us. It should be a challenge. Why do I believe in Jesus? And if we challenge ourselves to know why do I believe in Jesus and answer that question, that gives us power in our defense of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's a really important thing. Because it's more strong to give reasons than to just say, it's what I believe. It's fine to just believe it. That's great because we haven't seen him and yet we believe in him. But Christ is in all of the scriptures, isn't he? So, we have these five questions now. Six questions. Who or what is our emphasis? It should be him. Who or what is our focus on? It should be him. Who or what is our goal or target? Him and the work that we should be manifesting through, you know, through his influence in our life. Where do our loyalties lie? Are we going to betray him? I surely hope not. Our loyalties should be in him. What do we see? What witness are we believing of Jesus, right? So what do we see when we're looking at Jesus? Do we see a myth? Do we see historical man that is in fact also the son of the living God and the sinless son of man that is free to be able to testify and say these people are sinners because I have proven that I am sinless. What do we see? And the final question for tonight, what do we believe? After all of those other questions and looking at the evidence, what do we choose to believe? Why do we believe in Jesus? Let's find out. That's the thing that I'm pushing here. Let's find out. Why do we believe in Jesus? Why? Why should we believe in him? Why should we tell other people to believe in him? Okay, we know the generic answer, have faith in God, like was mentioned this morning. Why should I believe in Jesus? He is the light of the world. He is the bread of life. He is the answer. Let's find the answer. Get to know him who to know is life eternal. Once you know him and make him a part of you, now you have a convincing argument. So, these people, this is really the key. These people knew the scriptures, but they were so blinded by their traditions that they forgot who God was. They were so blinded by their traditions that they forgot to search and to know who God was. They only looked at what God could do. And then people were saying, this is the generic person on the street. They were asking, surely he must be the Christ, because nobody else can do these miracles like him. The Christ. Who is that prophet with a capital P? Maybe he is the Christ. But the Pharisees didn't even seem to ask that question themselves, though they were privy to all the previous knowledge. They chose to let themselves be darkened. They chose it. They must have chosen it. Because the evidence was right there in front of them, talking to them. Because no man spake like this man. We need to know this man Jesus more and more. It's the same thing that I've said the last few weeks, but this is so important. He brought the people with him, but when they couldn't take what he was saying, they fell off. Surely I pray that we don't do that. They needed to stay with him, to see the further progression, but they left it. But the disciples, they didn't. Eleven out of them were success stories. Eleven out of them. And one of them was a betrayer. Now, my um, message for tonight is already concluded. I planned to do chapters 6 and 7 of the Gospel of John. There is so much more that I'm not covering. But we can see the people were in two minds. The people that were against him, obviously, were being influenced somehow by the established uh, traditional church, let's call it church. And as he reveals his doctrine even further, and he reveals that he is the bread of life, 
which we have partaken of, then the progression comes even further. Now he's not going to the feast in secret. He is actually talking to the people face to face and they marvel at his doctrine. Even that is amazing. They're marveling at his doctrine and yet refuse to believe on him. And even though the scriptures say that there is one coming who will be that one, and they still don't believe in him. That's amazing. The evidence was right there in front of their face, and yet they were darkened. By choice. I believe it was by choice. The same happened when he was a child. They marveled at his doctrine. Surely they would have had that, oh, I know this one, I'm sure I remember this one. Because the feast is a big public time. Everybody's gathered together. And so his doctrine, which started in this couple of chapters, by giving people bread and referring to that physical uh, supply, now he's saying, I am your supply for eternal life. Then it goes further, then it goes further, then it becomes completely public. And it says in verse, let's see where it is again. I want to go over it one more time. Verse 37, it says, In the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried. Can you imagine crying aloud at a place where the people are wanting to kill you? If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. At a feast where people are eating and drinking. Because it's a feast. He that believeth on me, so straight away, Instead of just physical stuff, he's talking about spiritual. He that believeth on me, as the scripture have said, referring to the evidence, or I should say the prophets, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. Remember, this is on the back of previous miracles and marvelings by the other people. The people that were around him, nobody spoke like this man. I couldn't arrest him. Nobody speaks like him. And yet. So my suggestion for us all, let's determine to get to know Jesus more and more. I'm going to go through the next part of John next time I'm up. It is something else for us to know who we're believing in. It is critical. Because it's great to know that we believe in Jesus. Yes, I am a Christian. And to be bold about it, that's good. But we also need to know why. Why? Is it Because if we don't, this is the key. If we don't know why we believe what we believe, then we are weak in terms of, well, why do you believe what you believe? Is it just because your parents went to church and now you go to church and you call yourself a Christian? That's a stumbling block. Let's get rid of those stumbling blocks. We need to know. It doesn't matter how long on the road you've been. If you don't know why you believe in Jesus, it's time to find out why we believe in Jesus. And we, as Christians, very often say, let's start with the book of John. Then let's start with the book of John so that we can examine his life. And let's just check the evidence. We're not going to see all of the evidence because it's all over the scriptures, all over it. But we're going to start with the Gospel of John. So my suggestion, let's get to know him more and be determined about it. Put things in front of us that will refer to knowing Jesus more and more. It is a personal relationship with the God of the universe. And if he's got time to be bothered to forgive my sin, then surely we owe it to him to get to know him a bit better. That's my, that's my few words to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So, shall we stand and pray? Ah, oh, we have to do offering and stuff? So, we'll pray, do the offering with uh, Sister Dawn, and then we'll follow what's next. All right. Dear Lord, we thank you for, again, bringing us into this meeting tonight. We thank you for the chance and the liberty that we have to read your scriptures and to try to understand who you are. Thank you for the chance that we have to see Jesus as revealed in the scriptures. And we pray that you will give us inspiration to read and think and digest and be better from, the, from reading tonight's scriptures. 
even just to know that Jesus is real and that all of those prophecies from the previous scriptures in the Old Testament and the things written about him in the New Testament agree, they dovetail, and they are revealing the Son of God who created the universe. Help us to understand a bit better. Help us to trust in you more and more. And as a result, help us to love you and to know you more and more. And so, as we're soon to uh, dismiss from this service tonight, please bless us, take care of us, help us to have an excellent week, give us good success, and help us to leave knowing that you are our friend and our God. In Jesus' name we pray it. Amen. All right, so please welcome Sister Dawn. Thank you. Well, if you have a reference Bible, um, look at the references because when Jesus fed the 5,000, it says in 2 Kings, when they said that about that prophet, um, it talks and it says, His servitor said, What should I set this place, set this before an hundred men? He said again, Give the people that they may eat, for thus saith the Lord, they shall eat and shall leave thereof. Now that is in Kings. And then in Deuteronomy, it says about that prophet, um, it also mentions here where it says that, um, that the Lord will give a prophet, that prophet, capital P, again. So I was thinking, when you look at the Old Testament scriptures that we've got, look at the size of the pages, I mean, obviously, pages thickness differs, but look at that, right? This is the New Testament, and everything that Jesus said came from this amount of writing, and, you know, yet he was a, he knew all of this, and so did the scribes and the Pharisees, because they referred back to it, didn't they? In that, just what we've heard uh, Aaron say. So they were well versed in that. And yet with all, the truth was staring them right in the face and that they didn't recognize it. It's quite amazing. You know, I mean, I, do not, I wouldn't want to be like that. Do you know what I mean? If something is staring you right in the face, wouldn't you want to be able to know that this truth is sub something that you should, um, you know, take in and absorb. So interesting. And as Aaron says, there's so much more. We can never exhaust um, any of the scriptures. They're too deep, too big, too wide. But again, uh, why are we Christians? Why do we believe in the Lord? And you can say, well, for me personally, you can personalize it. It's true. Um, and I suppose that would be a, a starting point, but really it's so much bigger than that, isn't it? Um, anyway, so we need to, I need to give you greetings from Dermot and Sharon and the family, and just to say hello to the church, and that Dermot was tuned into the uh, program last night, and he was blessed by the message that Brother Chambers presented, and it was, of course, breaking of bread. Um, last night so in the light of people not being able to be here for breaking of bread last night we are going to have communion again next Saturday all right so I'm sorry that some of you guys couldn't make it but we will do communion again next Saturday all right um, and that's basically it for the announcements um, prayer meeting obviously on Tuesday all right? And as Aaron said, good success this week. Amen to that. <laughs> All right, so let's stand. I think we're going to sing one more song, Angie, or whatever. Um, let's stand and dismiss. We'll sing one more song, and then we'll go on our way. We don't need, oh, sorry, the offering. Duh, that's what I'm up here for, to receive this evening's offering. So while we're singing, Brother King, We'll receive this evening's offering from you guys and um, we'll meet up either on Tuesday or 
next weekend. And thankfully, we don't need to set up the church. Isn't that good? Yes, so we're relieved of a job for the next few weeks anyway. And so let's have Angie back. Let's sing the while we're giving the offering, and then we'll dismiss and go. Thank God for that. Amen. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the man.
good night and God bless.